Welcome to Medisagas, Tales in Medicine. This is Liam, your narrator for these incredible stories that were researched and written by physician and author, Dr. Rod Tanchanko. Prepare to be captivated by tales of perseverance, serendipity, medical misadventures, and the endless quest to conquer diseases. If you love history and true medical drama, then you're in the right place. Thank you for listening. When we left part one, Else Marie had just finally convinced Dr. Senning to help her husband. She was now seeking out the engineer responsible for making the pacemaker. We pick up the story with a look at that engineer, Dr. Rune Elmquist, in this second and final installment. Rune Elmquist jockeyed for a position to listen to a patient's heart as his classmates crowded around him. This was the 1930s and he was still in medical school. The professor described the murmurs, snaps, and clicks as the throng of trainees took turns pecking at a volunteer with their cocked stethoscopes. Elmquist had a better idea. He rigged a device that connected a microphone to the professor's stethoscope, which relayed the heart sounds to individual headsets. Now they could hear every rhythmic lub-dub without the jabs from wayward elbows. Elmquist possessed an impish grin, hinting he was up to something. With his thick eyeglasses, tussled hair, and skewed bow tie, he seemed destined to be an inventor. Beyond the spectacles, his brain churned out solutions before others even realized that there was a problem. Born at the turn of the 20th century in the southern city of Lund, he was likely influenced by the engineering advancements of his day. His father, a tailor, encouraged his son's inventiveness by buying Elmquist all the electrical components he wanted. When Elmquist was in high school, during the early days of radio, his physics teacher visited their home, sat in the kitchen, and listened to a radio broadcast for the first time. The radio was one of Elmquist's early creations. Like Senning, he wanted to pursue a career in engineering. Elmquist lived in Lund, home to Lund University, one of the oldest schools in Europe, which unfortunately did not offer any engineering courses. Like Senning, Elmquist picked medicine as a second choice, but he remained an engineer at heart. In his first chemistry course in 1926, he devised the first cathode-powered voltmeter, and the cheap electric stethoscope for the lecture hall came a few years later. While still in medical school, he founded Lund's University Instruments with his friend Peter Peterson. One of the first devices they produced was a pH meter with an instant readout, for which Elmquist earned one of his first patents. They also improved the ECG machine in collaboration with a company called Elema. After graduating in 1939, his only clinical experience as a doctor was short but likely sweet. During his honeymoon, he worked as a ship's doctor for a few months in a cruise ship. His small company eventually merged with Yarns Electriska, a company that manufactured X-ray machines and elevators. He continued to collaborate with Alema which later became Alema Schonander, and in 1940 he was named head of the medical electronics development. Not a trivial feat for someone without an engineering degree. Elmquist then began his long collaboration with the Karolinska Hospital. His early projects included Senning's fibrillator defibrillator. By 1957, Elmquist and Senning were testing external portable pacemakers on the dogs that Else Marie had seen in the hospital garden. Elmquist had assured Senning that he would create an implantable version, but he wasn't in a big hurry to deliver the prototype. Senning was not overly concerned. There was no urgency at the time, and there were other things to worry about. Later, Senning discovered the reason for the delay. The cardiologists were absolutely against it. They had warned Elmquist that pacemakers were dangerous and there was no use for them. Plus, the clergy were against it too. The church was appalled that man would revive a heart that, quote, God had stopped, unquote. With all these objections, the hospital authorities prohibited Elmquist from creating a pacemaker prototype. But when Arne's condition became increasingly desperate, the hospital conceded to allow Elmquist to make one pacemaker as a life-saving measure. Senning phoned Elmquist. Remember, when you have a man drowning near you, you have to give him a hand. 
He was preaching to the choir master, as Elmquist never had any qualms about making the device. When the distraught Else Marie was pleading with Elmquist to make the pacemaker, he had simply replied, Oh yes, we can always do that. Else Marie finally got her wish. It was time to inform Arna. Else Marie had not told him of her efforts to convince Senning and Elmquist to implant a pacemaker. She did not want to let him know until she was sure Senning and Elmquist were on board. She walked into Arne's room and told him everything. Arne was surprised, but he also understood that he must try anything and everything to survive. Later that afternoon, Senning and Elmquist visited Arne to discuss what implanting a pacemaker would entail. He was likely told that, that there had never been any human testing and that there were many unknowns. But it may be his only chance. Senning expressed his confidence. Let's do it. An engineer himself, Arne wanted to know the technical details about the pacemaker, and Elmquist was happy to oblige. Their first meeting went well, kindling not only hope for Arne, but the start of a lasting friendship. Else Marie was thankful that despite her badgering, the two doctors were always kind and accommodating. She had successfully orchestrated the critical first steps to save her husband. Arne's last chance now lay at the hands and minds of a self-taught engineer and an intrepid surgeon. At a small corner of the medical electronics lab at the Yarns Electriska, Elmquist sat hunched before his cramped workstation, eyeglasses off, hair uncombed, his left hand clutching a soldering rod. He was smiling. It was the smile of a boy left to play with all the toys he ever wanted. Before him sprawled an impossible tangle of cables, assorted plastic bottles, measuring instruments, electrical tape, electronic components, and more cables. Above the desk, two makeshift shelves supported hefty oscilloscopes, a swinging jointed clamp-on lamp, dangling wires, and more instruments. It was a chaos of tools and parts in a small corner of a room where Elmquist transformed idea into invention. This was Elmquist's domain. His pacemaker was a simple device. Senning and Elmquist had already determined from external pacemakers that the ideal heart rate was 72 beats per minute. They calculated the pulse generator should deliver 2 volts for 1.5 milliseconds, 72 times every minute. For the power source, Elmquist used two nickel-cadmium batteries. To recharge the power cells, he devised an external generator that would send a charging current via induction. This meant no skin punctures or direct connections to the pacemaker would be necessary. Elmquist also needed the most state-of-the-art silicon transistors available. Transistors were replacing large vacuum tubes in the late 50s, allowing engineers to miniaturize electronic devices. These new components were not only costly at 700 Swedish krona each, but they were scarce. Elmquist had ordered the silicon transistors, but they had not arrived. All he could do was wait. Meanwhile, Arne remained completely bedbound. Some days he passed out once, other days he blacked out repeatedly. His years as an athlete probably helped him endure the unpredictable spells. Perhaps motivated by Senning and Elmquist's plan, he survived day after day as he waited for his pacemaker. In early October 1958, the new silicon transistors finally arrived. Elmquist had all the components. It was now a matter of assembling the prototype. Amid the clutter of his workstation, Elmquist wired and soldered the first implantable pacemaker inside the familiar puck-sized Kiwi brand canister. Using the tin cylinder as mold, he poured epoxy over the components, securing them in permanent suspension. The pacemaker was a transparent medallion with visible internal components and two insulated, twisted antenna-like wires projecting from the narrow sides of the disc. Elmquist wasn't quite done. The hospital director allowed Elmquist and Senning to build one pacemaker for Arne. After he completed the first pacemaker, Elmquist gathered more components and started on a second one. October 8, 1958, Karolinska Hospital. The surgical crew quietly wheeled Arne into the operating theater. Concerned with attracting attention, Senning scheduled the operation late at night when the surgical suites were not busy. 
At nine o'clock, the team was ready. The procedure progressed with no problems. Senning opened the chest wall, exposing the heart. He then sutured the pacemaker wires into the heart muscle and secured the pacemaker underneath Arna's abdominal muscles. The new device immediately transmitted impulses and paced Arna's heart. Arna awoke from the anesthesia, sensing more vigorous heartbeats. It was a tremendous sensation. And for the first time in many months, he felt that the heart block was gone. But the euphoria did not last. The brisk heartbeats were only a cruel tease as Arne sensed his pulse dwindle. At two in the morning, three hours after the prototype was implanted, it completely stopped pacing Arne's heart. Seeing his patient fading, the medical resident monitoring Arne alerted Senning. The thing isn't working anymore. Senning was not amused and phoned Elmquist right way. Now this damn pacemaker is dead. Else Marie had not seen her husband since he was went into surgery. No one had called her with any updates on his condition. Concerned, she called Senning to ask what was going on. Senning told her the bad news about the pacemaker failure. But not to worry, they had another one in reserve. Elmquist would bring in the second device, and Senning would perform another operation in the morning. Arne still had a chance. The second implantation, the first implantable pacemaker replacement in history, was more successful than the first. Arne was awake this time as he heard Senning and his team cut the original cables, take out the dead pacemaker, solder, tuck, and sew in the new unit. As with the first unit, Arne immediately sensed the robust heart contractions. It was the same wonderful sensation of a strong heartbeat that he felt with the first pacemaker. But this time, the strong pulsations did not fade. It was the first sign in many months that Arne would survive. Ever the active spirit, Arne did not wait long to venture a few steps. News of the operation somehow got out. Elmquist's home was inundated with phone calls. Physicians from all over the world called at ungodly hours asking for a pacemaker. Despite the attention, Elmquist didn't think the pacemaker would amount to anything significant. He considered it a mere engineering curiosity. When the telephone kept ringing off the hook, his son Haken asked him if the invention would be a great thing. Elmquist didn't think so. This will never be big. This is something which we have to do to give service to our clients who bought other medical electrical apparatus. Elema Schoenander considered applying for a patent, but not everyone in the company agreed. Elmquist thought there was no commercial potential and they decided not to pursue the application. The second pacemaker lasted a week before it malfunctioned. There was a problem with the wire lead connected to the heart. The incessant bending of the stainless steel electrode more than 100,000 times a day proved too much for the wire, causing it to fracture. The electrical impulses became erratic. In December 1958, Arna and the medical team decided to stop the pacemaker therapy until better leads were developed. They left the pacemaker in place. Arna's heart was now beating on its own. And while he still had varying degrees of AV block, the Stokes Adams attacks did not recur. The weeks of artificial pacing may have brought some clinical benefit after all, despite the setbacks. Following this experience with the first two prototypes, Senning was not optimistic about the future of the pacemaker. He expressed his disappointment during the American Association for Thoracic Surgery Conference held in Los Angeles in April 1959. He believed that the voltage requirements to maintain effective pacing increased over time until the heart no longer responded to the artificial stimulation. The resistance of the heart, or whatever it is, increases more and more, so that a higher and higher voltage is required. And when one reaches the neighborhood of 20 volts, the whole patient jumps. So I don't think this is the way to tackle this problem. It took more weeks before doctors allowed Arne to go home. He could barely walk. His recovery was in his hands now. He was back in control of his new life. Arne determined to endure his sluggishly arduous convalescence. Outside their Stockholm house was a sidewalk lined with street lamps spaced every 25 meters. He started with a slow trek to the first lamp, 25 meters, 
then back home for another 25 meters. With each attempt, the next lamppost was the goal, then the next one, and then the next one after that. On each of these many ventures, Else Marie and Malou walked by his side, goading him on. A year later, he could stroll around the neighborhood. Following the problem with the damaged leads of the second pacemaker, Elema Schonender collaborated with Ericsson, a telecommunications company, to develop a flexible wire that could withstand the mechanical stresses of a pumping heart. By late 1959, they produced a more pliant electrode with a platinum disc connected at the end. Arna involved himself with this development and had the new lead tested at the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. The tests showed that the new version could withstand 184 million cycles of bending, the equivalent of six years of use. Elema Shonander refined the device, producing a few pacemakers and leads. Arna continued to recover, and when he no longer suffered any Stokes Adams attacks, he moved on without pacemaker support. Arna's heart block, however, was never cured. He functioned well with heart rates between 35 to 40 beats per minute, but when they dipped into the 20s, he became extremely weak. By 1961, these severe drops occurred so frequently that Arna asked to have his pacemaker therapy restarted. In November of the same year, he was back in the operating theater where Senning performed a second thoracotomy, removed the Elmquist prototype, and implanted the new Alima 137 mercury zinc pacemaker. The unit worked well for a year before it required replacing with a similar pacemaker in 1962. Over the next four decades, he would undergo 24 surgical procedures related to the pacemaker as his clinical course mirrored the evolution of pacemaker technology. As pacemaker development sped up in Sweden, similar progress occurred in the United States. Doctors Chardak and Gage repurposed hospital space meant for laundry at the Veterans Administration Hospital in Buffalo, New York, into a modest surgical research laboratory. They had several projects to work on, but limited resources forced them to make difficult choices on which research areas to pursue. In the end, Wilson Greatbatch, an electrical engineer working with the group, convinced them technology was available to construct an implantable pacemaker. They began animal experiments on May 5, 1958, using a battery-driven external pacemaker. The group encountered similar challenges with electrodes, infections, and power sources as Senning and Elmquist did in Sweden. Chardak, however, was not aware of what was happening in Sweden. The internet and email did not exist, and information did not circulate as rapidly as it did 40 years later. Chardak's group did not attend the 1959 surgical conference in Los Angeles when Senning shared his experience and early disappointments with the technology. Chardak later wrote that it was fortunate that they were not aware of Senning and Elmquist's work, as they would have been discouraged had they heard Senning's dissuading report. They treated their first patient in September 1959, a 65-year-old man suffering from 20 Stokes Adams attacks a day. Arne quickly learned the limitations imposed by the new technology on his daily life. Common tasks and routine life events now required pre-planning. He was forbidden to drive. To avoid disrupting the pacemaker, Bjorn and Malou were not allowed to hug their father. All travel plans became far more complicated. Many questions needed answers. If he were in an accident, would the treating doctors know what to do with the pacemaker? How would he explain a pacemaker to confused and irate security officials in airports? What if he needed medical care in another country? There was a myriad of otherwise mundane scenarios that needed to be addressed. Arne realized that as more people received pacemakers, the need for education became more important. He became the president of the Swedish Association for Heart and Lung Disease, assembled a travel kit for pacemaker recipients, created wallet cards with pacemaker specifications, and developed educational materials. He spoke in conferences and liked to tell audiences that the first implantation may have been a sensational event in medicine, but it is even more sensational for a person receiving a pacemaker. Eventually, Arne went back to work. An hour a day at first, and then eventually a full day. He strolled around Stockholm, played golf, and traveled to ports to inspect ships. And much to Else Marie's joy, she could once again dance with her husband. Arne was back, 
battered and not as nimble, but living as close to his former life as he could. With his intimate knowledge of pacemakers, Arna sometimes found himself at odds with his physicians. A man accustomed to being in charge, he did not hesitate to refuse treatments he felt uncomfortable with. When more reliable lithium batteries became available, Senning recommended changing Arna's pacemaker. Arna declined, citing the early problems with the leads and batteries. No, we stick with this pacemaker. We know it will last for about two and a half to three years, but the lithium we do not know yet. In 1969, his doctors wanted to upgrade his pacemaker to an advanced version. But Arna believed the old system was working well enough. He stuck with the older technology. In 1974, when he experienced worsening discomfort from abnormal heartbeats, he finally agreed to the upgrade. Elmquist continued inventing, working on projects related to pacemaker development, inkjets, and other technologies. He tinkered and pondered with passion for as long as he could. He filed his last patent in 1978 on the liquid jet recorder when he was 72 years old. Lund University, recognizing the contributions of their once aspiring engineer, bestowed an honorary doctorate in engineering. He received a prestigious West German award for his groundbreaking. In 1977, the King of Sweden awarded him the coveted gold medal from the Swedish Academy of Engineering Science. Few people could have been prouder than his own son Hakon, who once rode with him on that beautiful October day. Inspired by his father, he became a professor of biomedical engineering at the Karolinska Institute, founding several technology companies and owning 66 patents on pacemakers. Elmquist celebrated his last birthday on December 1, 1996, surrounded by family and close friends. Two weeks later, on December 15th, Rune Elmquist passed away at 90. For a man with a boundless passion for his work, he knew how to take things in stride. One should take what one does seriously, but never one's self. Three years after Arne's first implantation, Senning moved to Switzerland as chief of the Department of Surgery at the University of Zurich. He established a specialized intensive care unit in Switzerland, the first in Central Europe. He focused on experimental surgery, starting a kidney transplant program in 1964 and performing Switzerland's first heart transplant in 1969. During his stellar career, he introduced the Senning procedure to correct transposition of the great vessels, performed the complete correction of anomalous pulmonary vein and other innovations on lung, liver, and vascular surgery. When coronary angioplasty was introduced in 1977, he provided surgical standby as his colleague Andreas Grunzig performed the first percutaneous transluminal coronary angioplasty, PTCA. Senning retired in 1985. On July 21, 2000, following a long illness, Ake Senning passed away in Zurich. He was 86 years old. Set against an ochre, ivy-draped stucco wall, Arne and Else Marie sat together in their yard, perfectly at ease, enjoying the soft sunlight as they chatted and shared some biscuits. Else Marie looked younger than her 77 years, poised and graceful with her full, dark hair brushed back and neatly ribboned. She glanced at Arne as they talked, flashing a coy smile and nodding, appearing content with the simple pleasure of a simple day with her husband. Arne was 85 years old now, his movements more measured, unhurried, his voice still robust with a tinge of tremor as he retold the story that he must have told countless times. On this day, it was for a film crew from the Karolinska Institute. His memory remained true as he recalled those early days. He made sure he always credited his wife, perhaps even fringing on the dramatic. So my wife read this. He was referring to the magazine article Else Marie had read in 1958 and went to find Ake Senning and told him that now is the time for the doctor to make the impossible possible and make sure that my husband's heart works properly again. And then driving his point? Then Ake Senning said both in speech and writing that without Elsa Marie Larson, the pacemaker would never have emerged that fast like it did. It would have perhaps taken several more years. So she was the woman behind it all. 
A few years before, he proclaimed, My wife attacked the doctor night and day. He was proud of her for good reasons and professed it every chance he got. Arne was not well as they filmed the video in 2000, but it had nothing to do with his heart. Sometime in the early 90s, his daughter Malou noticed an odd mole on his back and asked him to have it checked. It turned out to be melanoma. They said perhaps he had two years to live. Almost 10 years later, he was still around. At 85, he had exceeded the normal life expectancy in Sweden by several years. He had outlived his good friends, Senning and Elmquist. Arna received his last pacemaker when he was 80 years old, the Regency 2404 from St. Jude Medical, with a transvenous lead from Medtronic. Weighing 18.5 grams with a flat, sleek design, it made the original 50-gram prototype look atrociously bulky. From a two-transistor fixed-rate pulse generator to a computer chip with millions of transistors that monitor each heartbeat and deliver the perfect amount of energy to the heart, the pacemaker had come a very long way. And so had Arna. A year later, with his health declining from the melanoma, he spent his last days at his home in the Stockholm suburb of Saltsjö Dövne. He passed away peacefully on December 28, 2001. He succumbed to the cancer, not his long-damaged heart. Else Marie always considered herself and Arne to be fortunate that Senning and Elmquist were at the Karolinska in 1958. She remembered their kindness, patience, and courage in taking a great risk to save her husband. She remembered how Senning publicly spoke of her, graciously attributing Arne's salvation and the precocious birth of the modern pacemaker to her determination. She remembered how great friends they all had become, sharing birthdays, attending the many pacemaker conferences, tributes and awards, or simply getting together for an occasional dinner. She remembered the harrowing night in 1958, how thin the thread was between life and death, and how Arne relished his new life. Expected to die at 43, Arne had lived twice his life expectancy, propelled by his own love for life, saved by the talents of an imaginative engineer a gifted surgeon, and an utterly devoted wife. That concludes this week's episode of Medisagas. We hope you found today's journey both captivating and enlightening. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider subscribing as well as leaving a review on your preferred platform. Also consider becoming a patron of this podcast. Come visit the website and send us your comments, suggestions, or ideas for stories that you want featured in future podcasts. We always appreciate your feedback and support. Thank you.